Good morning and welcome to worship this morning in First Korean. If you are visiting, you are very, very welcome and congratulations in being out on such a cold, icy day. There's many as a better day you've sat at home by the fire, so thank you for coming this morning. Let us worship God together. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's begin Advent season by singing together, Joy to the World. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Isaiah was right. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. But you have laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to be our shepherd saviour. Having laid down his life as the Lamb of God, you raised him to life, and now the he is the shepherd of your people, relentlessly caring, vigilantly, vigilantly protecting, and faithfully providing for us. You never sleep. You never slumber. Because you are always interceding for us and advocating for us. Good shepherd sounds profoundly understated. Because of your great love for us, we lack nothing that we need for life and for godliness. In peace, we lie down in green pastures and beside quiet waters. All for the restoring of our tired, weary, broken and rebellious souls. Thank you for the green pasture and the still water of our fellowship and worship this morning. For your glory and our good, you guide us along paths of righteousness and goodness, truth and grace. And even when that journey leads us through the darkest valley, you are with us. And that is all we really need to know. We don't have to be afraid, for the good news of Jesus brings us lasting peace and great joy. When enemies are close and threatening, you are even closer. The nearer we live to you, the stronger the fragrance of your grace and the more certain your sovereign rule become to us. Father, thank you. 
we will always live securely. For you are our peace, now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to God's goodness as we sing God of Grace. going to begin a little series uh, leading up to Christmas called The Gift, and we're going to be thinking about some passages in the Christmas story, and also some that are not usually looked at in the Christmas story. This morning we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 15, and Stephen is going to come and read this for us. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests, teachers of the law, and asked them where the Christ was to be born, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and, uh, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and the mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. 
Boys and girls, will you come to the front because I'd like to come down and talk to you for a moment. So I want to tell you a story today that you're going to learn out in Adventurers. It's the last in the little series that you've been doing just before you start your little Christmas series. It's still about that man called Isaac. Do you remember Isaac? Oh, you haven't been here in the last couple of weeks. Okay. Isaac, Isaac found a, a wife called Rebecca, and uh, Rebecca and Isaac had two boys. They had two boys, twins, if you like. Uh, tw twins. <laughs> twins. <laughs> one was called Esau, and one was called Jacob. Esau was big and burly and hairy, and he loved the outdoors, he loved hunting, and his dad Isaac loved meat, so he was really close to his dad Isaac, he, you know, he loved hunting, he loved the outdoors, camping, all of that kind of thing, and Jacob wasn't. Jacob was smooth, <laughs> he wasn't hairy at all, he was smooth, and he didn't like the outdoors very much, he, he liked staying at home, he loved cooking. Uh, he was a very, very good cook, actually, a very good cook. And uh, I want to tell you about a word that is used in the story of Jacob and Esau. It's a big word. It's the word birthright. Birthright. It's a difficult word. What does a birthright mean? Well, if you think of it, it's a little bit like one of these it's a little bit like a gift. It's a gift that a dad in the days of Jacob and Esau gave to the oldest in the family. And the gift was the gift of everything that the family owned. The house, the car, the bank account, everything. Everything went usually to the oldest who was Esau usually went to the oldest in the family. And it was given <clears throat> at a certain time when the, the children was old, were old enough, it was given in the form of a blessing. The, the father would lay his hand on the oldest child and say, you have been given the birthright. You've been given everything. Well, let me tell you, Jacob wasn't very fond of that. Jacob didn't really like the fact that uh, Esau was older than him. In fact, even from the, before they were born, they were fighting. They were fighting even before they were born. And they fought their whole lives. They really didn't like each other. And Jacob really didn't like it that Esau was in line. He was the oldest. He was going to get the birthright. He was going to get everything that the family owned. He didn't like that. So one day, Esau was away hunting, big hairy hunting, out, out, out in the, the, the countryside. And he came back and he, was, he had caught nothing because he was a pretty useless hunter. <laughs> okay? He had caught nothing, and he was starving. He was really hungry, really, really hungry. And he said to Jacob, I am so hungry I could die. Well, thought Jacob, hmm, that's interesting, because I just made the most delicious pot of stew. Hmm. Would you like some of my stew, Esau? Yes, please. Yes, please. Esau thought to himself, that would be lovely. Well, said Jacob, I'll do you a deal. You give me your birthright and I'll give you a bowl of stew. <laughs> Is that a good deal? No. Good, <laughs> good deal for Jacob. Not so much for Esau. Well, Esau said, I am so hungry I could die. What good's a birthright if I'm going to die? He wasn't going to die. He was just hungry. But he couldn't wait. So he said, give me the bowl. So Jacob took him the bowl. and He, he took the bowl and he ate it all up. Mm. And off he went. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Jacob thought to himself, I'm going to have to do a little bit more to get this birthright. That's a deal between me and Jacob, but there's no way my dad is going to buy that. I need somebody old. I need somebody old and David, would you come and help us, would you? Somebody old and wrinkly and who looks like a grandfather, who looks, who looks his years, who looks his years. David, 
you, you have a wee seat. You have a wee seat. You have a wee seat. So, Jacob thought, I'm going to have to do something here. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to trick. And, and Jacob was old, and, and he was going, can you take your glasses off? Yeah. He was getting a wee bit blind, okay? C- couldn't see properly. Jacob thought, you know what I'm going to do? The day came for the birthright to be given out. Jacob thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this on, and I'm going to go into my dad, and I'm going to pretend to be Esau. He's going to think, he can't see very well. The tent's dark. I'll go in, and I'll put this over my head, and he'll think I am Esau. So he went into the tent, and he said, <coughs> Hello, Dad. And Isaac said, uh, Who's that? And Jacob said, <coughs> It's Esau, your oldest son. <coughs> and uh, Isaac thought, That doesn't sound very much like Esau. He said, Come a wee bit closer so that I can feel the hair on your head. Well, that, that was going to be a wee bit difficult, but... Jacob had it all planned, so and he went, they put, and oh, look, oh, that's hairy, Isaac said, that's hairy, it must be Esau. And so he laid his hand on Jacob, and he gave him the blessing, the birthright. Thank you very much, Isaac. So Jacob stole the gift, stole the gift from his brother Esau. Good or bad? Bad. And let me tell you, there's going to be trouble because of it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is an amazing story. And we look at Jacob and we look at Esau and we see the trouble that they got into by deceiving and telling lies and stealing. Father, forgive us for when we do that. But we thank you, Lord, that you're at work in and through it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you're going to go to adventures very shortly, but before you do, Emily's going to lead us in this lovely song, Stop and Think. Let's stand. Boys and girls, you can leave for adventurers. Have a great time learning the story of Jacob and Esau. And we're going to turn to God's Word together to Matthew chapter 2. And it will be helpful if you had it open. I know that you probably think I know that story off by heart. But it might be good to have that open in front of you as we look at it together again this morning. And let's pray as we do so. Heavenly Father, uh, your Word is trustworthy and true. We search and we look for something that we can rest our lives upon, a hope that is sure and steadfast. And so we turn to you and to your word this day. Speak to us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I asked Janice if she would like a gold necklace for Christmas. She said, nothing would please me more, so I got her nothing. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, really, really. This year I'm getting uh, a new motorcycle for Janice. <laughs> I think that's a great swap, you know, a great deal. A, motorci a motorcycle for Janice. 20 years ago at Christmas, you would hear a great deal of sermons about leaving the Christ out of Christmas. Do you remember those? And I remember a whole radio program uh, on Talkback, I think it was, complaining about shops advertising Xmas instead of Christmas, leaving the Christ out of Christmas. And I used to think, yeah, but... Nobody really leaves Christ out of Christmas, do they? But then yesterday morning, I was listening to a whole 10-minute section of a program on the radio about Christmas and about what people were looking forward to and what it really meant to them. And Jesus didn't even get a look and not once, not even alluded to, I guess we do need reminding. So this Advent, we are going to remind ourselves again of the gift at the center of Christmas. And we're going to start at the end of the story, if you like, with the wise men. Matthew simply tells us wise men or magi came from the east to Jerusalem to worship him. That's it. And we're left with lots of questions. Who were they? And where did they come from? But if you look at the text, there's nothing. The text provides us with no details whatsoever. There is nothing here that identifies them in any way. Of course, there's a lot of tradition and legend about them. Poets Painters and productions depict three of them riding on camels, dressed in flowing robes with crowns on their heads, singing, We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we traverse afar. You know it. And I suppose that suits well because it would be very difficult to sing We Kings of inter Indeterminate Number from somewhere far away in the, uh, in the East. wouldn't rhyme. But the truth is, we know little to nothing about them. Who they were, where they came from. So what do we do? Well, we move on. We could spend all Christmas coming up with options on their origins, and that might be good fun for a while, but it would be a waste of time. And we could spend till Easter on theories about what that star was. Was it a natural phenomenon or a supernatural event? And again, while that might be fun to do, we wouldn't be any further on. It would all just be conjecture. Now, I know people here this morning will be going, ah, but James, I heard that that star was a comet, and... I heard that those men came from Babylon and... Uh, okay, yes, okay. What I've said might not seem very satisfactory, leaving it as a mystery. But then, after all, Christmas is about the greatest mystery and miracle of all. The incarnation. God himself became human. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Now, that really is a mystery. Here's the truth. Nobody knows who the wise men were. And Matthew doesn't tell us because that's not his point. We do know, what we do know is that they came and they asked a question. Do you see? What was their question? They came asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? These wise men had come to the conviction that there was a significant king who had been born. That that king was in fact Jewish and that he had been born in Judea. That's why they arrived in Jerusalem. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have come to worship him. 
The Greek word that Matthew uses, and the NIV has translated it, not wise men. Some translations use wise men. But the, the actual word is magi. We do know what magi were. They were not just clever boys with double PhDs from Oxford and Cambridge. Magi is the name given by the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians and others, to teachers and priests and physicians and astrologers and seers and interpreters of dreams and soothsayers and sorcerers. So they were more than just scientists or theologians or astrologers. They were interested in all sorts of knowledge. Magi were people who were interested in all kinds of knowledge. To those who might say today, science deals in the realm of fact and faith deals in the realm of fantasy, well, these men would have said, catch yourself on. There's more to life than atoms. These men were interested in all kinds of knowledge. And that's refreshing, isn't it? That's how they ended up where they were. They were sincere individuals who were trying to figure things out. I'm sure that there are some wise men and some wise women here this morning and probably some wise men and wise women who are going to be listening online later. And they're trying to figure things out right now. You might be here trying to figure out what Christmas is all about or you might be here trying to figure yourself out or trying to figure life out. Maybe you're here trying to fit all of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together in life to see, does this actually mean anything? Maybe you're trying to understand why you're here. Why are you on this planet Earth? How did you happen to have any existence at all? Well, this morning you're in good company. That's the kind of thing these men were thinking. That's the knowledge that they sought. So a good question to ask is, how did they know? How did they know that a Jewish king, a Christ, an anointed king had been born? How did they know that? Okay, they'd seen this strange phenomenon, this star in the sky. But how did they know that that meant a Jewish king had been born? Well, put two and two together, they must have been reading the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. Most likely they had been reading the prophets and perhaps one prophet in particular, Daniel. Daniel spoke of a king who was to come. And Daniel had lived in the east, you remember, he was taken captive from Jerusalem into Babylon and lived there. So it is more than likely that they had been searching the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and stargazing at the same time. And then the, the, the star, the, the phenomenon that they saw in the sky and the scriptures that they had led them to a conclusion. Now again, don't, don't be hijacked by the star. If we needed a detailed explanation of it, Matthew would have given it to us. We don't, he doesn't give it because we don't need it. All we need to know is that this strange phenomenon that had never been seen before appeared in the sky, and that combined with the ancient truth of the Old Testament scriptures, these knowledge searchers put together and ended up in Judea. They went searching for the king of the Jews. Now, I, I want to jump all the way through the next text if you say, I don't, we're not going to deal with grumpy old Herod because he isn't worth spending time on. He's a grumpy old man. Sometimes I wake up grumpy. Other times I let her sleep on. I know, I know, I know. He's a grumpy old man, so we're not going to deal with him. When the Magi arrived in Jerusalem and they went to the palace, they began to ask questions. And what did they discover? Well, they discovered that they were in the wrong place at the right time. 
From a human perspective, they had made a very wise deduction. They said to themselves, well, it's a Christ, an anointed one, a Jewish king. Where do you find a Jewish king except in a capital? And where in the capital would you go to find a king? You would go to a palace. And so that's why they ended up at Herod's palace. They thought that they could get where they needed to be by human wisdom, by human deduction. But no one finds Jesus on the basis of human wisdom. Do you remember we saw in the book of James that we just came from where human wisdom takes you? Do you remember James talked about godly wisdom and human wisdom? And where human wisdom leads, it only leads to disaster and death. That's where this human wisdom led. They just quickly discovered that they had come to the wrong place, to the wrong king. Secondly, they discovered that the religious people, the scribes, the ones who had the Old Testament in their hands, the ones who had the Old Testament were able to give them the answer that they needed But they themselves didn't actually care two hoots about the Christ King. The scribes, the ones who were supposed to be searching, said, "Uh, King of the Jews, do do we have anything on that? Oh, oh, yes, we do. Micah chapter 5 tells us there's a king who was to come. But you, Bethlehem of Rapha, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who is from old. Yes, of course. They were completely aware that a Christ king was to be born. But they weren't even prepared to go the six miles down the road to find him and worship him. Religious professionals with a solid knowledge of the text who were completely disinterested in the Christ. And that's heartbreaking, isn't it? People who have the Bible, who know the Bible, but who have no personal acquaintance with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And because they do not know him, they are unable to introduce him to anyone else. How sad is that? These magi must have scratched their heads as they finally set off for Bethlehem, saying to one another, isn't isn't that amazing? You'd think that the people who knew the answer to the question of where the king would be born would be the very people leading us to his front door. But no. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is exactly what Matthew wants us to see here. You see, the Magi needed the Old Testament to point them in the right direction. It's God's word, it's the Bible. It is the Bible that leads us to the living word. There is no other way except through the Christ of God who is delivered to us in the word of God. They needed the scriptures to get where they needed to be. Now again, I have no idea how that star eventually led them to Bethlehem and stopped over the house where the Christ child was. No idea how that happened. Matthew doesn't tell us because that's not his point. Do you see they went into the house? The house, did you notice that? The house, not a stable. It was a stable when he was born, but it's a house later on. That, and that's the problem with the, the traditional nativity scenes. They kind of meld the whole story together into one um, just for your information, it wasn't that the shepherds got the three o'clock appointment and the, the wise men got the 9.30 appointment just before everybody packed up for the night. That's not the way it happened. It says, Matthew tells us here, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but we don't know how long after. It could have been a day, five weeks, two months, seven months, three years. We don't know how long. But after Jesus was born, these magi arrived and they came to the house where they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Do you notice Joseph doesn't get a mention? That's because dads do none of the work. It's all the mums, isn't it? It's all the mums. They're the ones who get up in the middle of the night. They're the ones who do Jesus with his mother, Mary. 
And do you see they fell down and they worshipped him? Do you notice that? I'm not going to preach on this now. Not them. They worshipped him. And they opened their treasures. And this, all of that was the introduction, by the way. Now we get to the, where we're going. These men opened up their treasures and they gave gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Why those gifts? Well, some say that they were expensive gifts and that God gave Mary and Joseph these expensive gifts. For when the Magi were warned and left to go home another way without going back to Herod, Herod was furious. And if you read on in the text and the next verses, he sets about trying to destroy every child under the age of two in the surrounding area to get rid of this Christ child. And some say that Mary and Joseph were given these expensive gifts so that whenever they fled to Egypt, they would have enough money to live there until it was safe to return. And that's probably true. God protects the Christ child by sending these millionaires to give a donation to care for Jesus so that he is protected. That, that could very well be true. And some say that gold and frankincense and myrrh are gifts that speak of Jesus' role. What this Christ child is going to do. Gold for a king. Frankincense for a priest, and myrrh for a prophet. And, and that is probably also true. There is symbolism here. But I think in the context of this passage, there is a better explanation than just trying to think up a reason why in our own heads and reason it out why they might have chosen these gifts. I think there is a deeper more profound reason. And this is where we're going to go over the next weeks. The Magi had chosen these gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They could have brought anything. They were, well, they were incredibly wealthy men, obviously. Gold and frankincense and myrrh are not cheap gifts. They're expensive. So obviously they could have given robes, camels, cows, whatever, but they chose these gifts. Why these gifts? Well, do you see that Matthew's focus has been to show us that the Magi found Jesus through the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament. Have you noticed that? When they st saw the star appear in the skies, they went to the Old Testament, obviously, to see what that star meant. And they found out in the Old Testament that a Jewish king was to be born. And when Herod's scribes saw the wise men, the magi standing in front of them, and heard their question, where is the Christ child to be born? Where did they go? They went to the Old Testament, to the book of Micah, to find out where the Christ child was to be born. So when we see these gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, where do you think we should go to find the answer as to what they mean? The Old Testament. Yeah, let's not go to ideas from out here. Let's go to the Old Testament and find where these three gifts are. Are mentioned because obviously they had chosen these three gifts because of what they had read. So when we go to the Old Testament, where do we find gold and frankincense and myrrh listed together? And it's pretty obvious if you go to your online Bible and you search gold and frankincense and myrrh, the first place will come up is Exodus chapter 30. Now, you don't need to flick back now because we're going to be flicking back over the coming weeks. Exodus chapter 30 describes a time when God is giving direction to Moses on the building of the tabernacle. 
You remember the tabernacle? The place that God, that was to, to speak to the people of God about God's presence with them. It was the place that was going to be built where God would meet with his people. It was to later become the model for the temple in Jerusalem and for temple worship in Jerusalem. And if you look at Exodus chapter 30, as I'm sure you'll rush home today and get out your Bible and look at it, when you do, as God willing, we will do in the coming weeks, you will see that gold and frankincense and myrrh were key elements in each of the courts of the tabernacle. You remember the, the tabernacle was divided into courts. There was an outer court where the sacrifices were uh, performed. Then there was an, an inner court called the holy place where the bread of the presence was placed and the seven-pronged uh, uh, candlestick was. And then you went through a big heavy curtain into the next court was the Holy of Holies. And only the priest went in there on the Day of Atonement once a year to make sacrifice for the people's sins. Three courts, three gifts. Frankincense was used primarily in the outer court uh, when burnt, it gives off a sweet, sweet fragrance. And if you can imagine all of the sacrifices taking place in the outer court, that, and amongst all of that unpleasant smell, would have been quite a nice fragrance. Frankincense was burnt along with the offerings. Myrrh was the key ingredient in the oil, the, the holy oil, the special oil that was made and set aside to be used only for anointing Aaron and the priests and the items within the holy place. And gold was the key element to the holy of holies. When you stepped through that huge curtain woven with gold, what you would see was the golden ark of the covenant with the mercy seat on top of it, with the cherubim with their wings touching, all made of gold. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gifts that all spoke of worship. Do you see the picture? Matthew is giving us this wonderful picture painted by numbers in this little story. Jesus is the Christ King. He is the one who is going to come and build a new tabernacle, a new temple, not made of wood and cloth or bricks and mortar, but made of a people who will bow like the Magi bowed to worship him. And we're going to spend some time over the next couple of weeks looking at those individual elements of the gift. Let me just finish here. I have no idea who these wise men actually were. But I hope one day to meet them. I want to do, I want to ask them a question. I want to ask them and I want to say to them, look, we got the part about you kneeling down and everything. But did you ever ask Mary... What's the child's name? Because that, that's the first thing that you do, isn't it? When you see a new baby for the very first time, what's the first question you ask? You don't just say, oh, that's a lovely wee baby. What do you say? You say, what's the name? What name have you given him? And I'm going to ask him, did, did Mary tell you that his name was Jesus? Because the angel had said to her, you shall give him the name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And I want to ask them, we all know that you arrived in Bethlehem with gold and frankincense and myrrh, with the treasure of earth in your hands. But what I want to know is, did you leave Bethlehem with the treasure of heaven in your heart? Because that's the whole point of the gift. Let's pray together. And Carl's going to come and lead us in prayer. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, in this Advent season, we thank you that we can look forward to celebrating Christ's birth and we can know the hope God has given us in Jesus. Help us to reflect on the wonder of your love and joy to the world. Yet as we look around, there is often little to be joyful about. The world is full of pain and suffering. But although we have trouble in this world, you have said, I have overcome the world, and so our hope is in you, our reigning Lord. And Lord, we pray for peace across the world, that wars in Israel, Gaza, Ukraine will cease, conflict between communities will end, and people will be able to live in safety. We give thanks for the aid organisations that seek to bring relief to refugees, the injured and bereaved, and bless all who give up their time to help others in distress. You came as the Prince of Peace, so we pray that justice and harmony may be restored to nations, that all in authority and leadership will seek the common good and not just their own ends. We pray for a resolution to the steelmate here in Northern Ireland to address the ever-increasing problems in health, education and economy. We remember all who are ill, comfort and bring your healing touch to all who suffer in mind, body or spirit. For those in residential or nursing care, may they know the compassion of staff who look after them. We pray for those two being cared for by family at home. Give strength and rest to carers so that they may be able to cope. Thank you for the homes run by the Presbyterian Church that support and care for those with various disabilities and needs. As a church family, we can freely celebrate Christmas and we thank you for that, Lord. But we do remember those who cannot do so openly because of persecution. Protect them from those who want to harm them, Lord, and sustain them in their faith, giving them renewed hope. For ourselves, Lord, we ask that just as you left heaven to come as a baby, to live on earth and then die on the cross for us, so help us to live faithfully serving you, the light of the world. And this, Lord, we ask in your precious name and for your glory. Amen. Let's praise God together. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with us this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.